Hello again, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the Gospel of Matthew. We pick up our study in Matthew chapter 20, verse 18. So grab your Bible, open it up to Matthew 20, verse 18. So excited to get back into the Word of God. I'm having such a great time in the Gospel of Matthew. It's just such a breath of fresh air to read about Jesus and to observe what he says and he does and amazing things that he does in the Gospels to prove that he is God and to prove that he was Israel's Messiah. Fantastic stuff here in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I hope you can grab your Bible and open it up so you can follow along. And while you're doing that, I will, as I always do, mention the Scripture Verse by Verse website which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And please take advantage of this. If you love the Word of God, I don't think there's a better place to be because that's all that's there. Believe me, I am all about the Word of God, and I have been for 37 years since I got saved. From day one, I have been all about the Word of God. And two years after I was saved, God called me to teach it, and I've been doing it ever since. Going through the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, three times in the last 30 years. And all three of those series through the Bible can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. So all you have to do is click and listen, and we can study the Word of God together. Well, let's get into it in Matthew chapter 20 right now, verse 18. How about praying first and then getting right into the Word? And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth, Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Matthew 20, verse 18. Jesus says, um, actually, let's read verse 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve apart on the way and said unto them. Now, he's headed toward Jerusalem and uh, is headed toward his death. And he knows it. So he says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Now this is the third time in just real recent history that he has warned them that this sort of thing was going to happen, that this was not a sort of thing. This thing was going to happen. He would be betrayed he would be murdered. And then he says in verse 19, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Every time he tells his disciples what is going to happen to him, he adds a few more details. This time he adds the fact that he's going to be mocked, he's going to be scourged, and he's going to be crucified. But he always throws on the end there, and I'm going to be raised the third day. You know, sometimes people do not understand the Word of God because they don't want to understand the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't say what they enjoy hearing. So somehow, some way, they block it out, even though they hear the words. Sometimes people don't understand the Word of God because they are clinging to to their preconceived ideas about what the Bible says, and they don't want to accept anything else. Now, that's a dangerous thing to do. You know, when you read the Word of God, you shouldn't come to the Bible, to God's Word, and read it with preconceived ideas of what it says. Let the Bible speak for itself. But you see, the disciples had a preconceived idea of what the Messiah would do. And being murdered by the religious rulers was not it. And it didn't matter how many times Jesus told them in clear, simple words that he would be murdered. It simply did not sink in. And we're going to see that when we get to Holy Thursday night and Good Friday. It didn't sink in. And it's not because Jesus had a problem speaking clearly. He knew how to communicate. Their minds were just shut to it because they had in their mind what the Messiah would do. And that wasn't it. 
It's amazing how people can read the Word of God and take the clear, simple, understandable Word of God and explain it away because it doesn't fit what they have been taught in the past. And they can see scripture after scripture that doesn't fit with what they've been taught in the past, and they find a way of explaining it away. As some preachers say, well, no, this is a problem verse. No, there's no problem verses. The problem is you don't take God's word at face value, and that's why you call it a problem verse. You know, there are over 120 verses that speak of the fact that you can lose your salvation if you're a Christian, and they're all called problem verses by those who think that you can't lose your salvation. They're called problem verses. Well, once you get up to about 120, um, it's no longer a problem with the verses. Of course, it never is. It's a problem with your theology, man. You better start lining your theology up with the Word of God instead of trying to twist and wrench the Word of God to, into lining up with your theology. So, it's important to let God's Word speak for itself. Just accept it for what it is and for what it says, even if it doesn't set well with you. Verse 20, watch this. Now, you know what he just said, right? He just once again announced that he was going to be betrayed and crucified, humiliated, scourged, murdered. And look at this, 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. The mother of James and John has a favor to ask Jesus on behalf of his two disciples, her two sons, James and John. So what is it? 20 and 21. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. I just want to say, wait a minute, lady. Wait a minute. You and your sons, they were probably standing close by. I don't know. But I want to say, wait a minute. Didn't you hear what Jesus just said? He's not going to Jerusalem to defeat the Roman Empire and establish a physical kingdom. He's going to Jerusalem to be murdered. Why are you saying that you want your sons to be sitting on his right hand and his left hand, the two top seats in the kingdom? Talk about going over your head. 22. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We are able. So James and John must have been standing there, hanging on to the uh, apron strings of their mother when she asked for this favor. I'd be embarrassed if I was James and John, to have my mom come and ask Jesus that. Wouldn't you? But Jesus says, first of all, you don't know what you're talking about. And she didn't. She, like some today, did not understand the spiritual nature of the kingdom of God, which is the church age. That's the first thing she didn't get. She didn't understand the nature of the immediate kingdom of God. And she didn't understand the nature of the leadership, obviously, in that kingdom either. Because leadership in the kingdom of God, leadership in the church, isn't about having political power and political muscle. It's about service and martyrdom if need be. Having a position of responsibility in the kingdom of God doesn't mean that a Christian is a celebrity. 
Leadership in the church is about hard work, it's about self-sacrifice, and it's about not expecting a reward until after you die, if need be. Leadership in the church, which is the mystery form of the kingdom on earth today, leadership in that church is about self-sacrifice, going all out for Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Even if no one is following you, you're still a leader. Not like the neo-evangelical I heard a while back. You can tell you're a Christian leader if you turn around and somebody is following you. How stupid and worldly is that for a definition of Christian leadership? No one followed John the Baptist to have his head chopped off for preaching against King Herod marrying his sister-in-law, but he was a leader. Verse 22. Verse 22 says, Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We are able. Drinking the cup is a figure of, of speech in Scripture which refers to suffering. It refers to the loss of popularity. It means enduring persecution. And in some cases, enduring death for Jesus. In other words, if you want to be great for God, then you need to understand the road that will get you there. And that road is self-sacrifice, self-denial, and being a servant to God and a servant to others. You do that, and you'll be great in the eyes of God. You still want to be a Christian leader? You still want to be a leader in the kingdom of God today? Then lead by example. Lead by doing those things. Verse 23. And he said unto them, because they said, we're able. Oh, yes. Yes, we can do that. Well, man, you don't even have the guts to ask Jesus yourself. You've got to ask your mommy to, to ask him, how are you going to put up with suffering as, as, as of right now? But you know what? When they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they're going to be completely changed, James and John. And they will, as Jesus says right here in verse 23. And he said unto them, I'm just saying, I just said what I said right now because as of right now, they don't have the guts to come up to Jesus and ask him for the ter first two spots in the, in the kingdom. They have to have their mom do it. What makes them think that they're able to suffer like crazy and give things up and sacrifice to follow Jesus? They answer really quickly, yes, we're able. Not in your own power, you aren't. They answered way too quickly. They're not thinking in terms of the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost. They're thinking in terms of their own human flesh. Oh, yes, we have the ability to do that. They don't. They will by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is why Jesus says in 23, He said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it, it, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared by my Father. So, James was beheaded in 44 AD. And John, his brother, was whipped and beaten and exiled. Both these brothers, just as Jesus predicted, did indeed suffer and they didn't compromise the truth about Jesus Christ to avoid that suffering in any way. They remained steadfast. And they were Christian leaders by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus said, you indeed will be baptized with the baptism that I was baptized with. And they certainly were short of the crucifixion. A Christian 
must have an unselfish attitude in order to serve Jesus Christ. Or you're never going to do it. You're never going to do it. If your head can be turned by a temptation, then you don't have what it takes. You don't have the dedication to follow Jesus Christ. If fear controls you, if the desire to be popular controls you, if the desire to be accepted by the world, and if you love the world, you don't have what it takes to serve Jesus Christ. A Christian has to have an unselfish attitude to serve Jesus effectively. But if you do, you will be considered great in the kingdom of God. But those who seek positions of authority in the church in order to be recognized by people or to become a Christian celebrity, and don't tell me there aren't Christians out there who strive for that. I've seen them. I know them. They want to be Christian celebrities. They may attain their goals. They may become the focus of many people's attention. They may have people applaud them when they preach. They may have people stand and applaud them and scream when they sing. But they will not be great in God's kingdom. 24. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. So the other ten apostles were angry at James and John because they asked for the top spots. And from what follows, it seems as if they were angry because they did not ask first. They were not outraged over the self-centeredness of the question. They were just upset that they didn't think about asking the question themselves. Verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. And that's the way it is in the world. Jesus is simply stating what we all know. In the world, the great ones are the ones who exercise power and influence on behalf of themselves. People often look to others who can push people around and they say, now that's the way I want to be someday. I want to be a big shot. I want to have that authority. I want to be a great one like that. I want everybody to envy me and say, I want to be like him. Jesus says, that's the way it is in this world. You flex your muscle. You force your way on people. You, come, you tell people what to do. You give them orders. They serve you. They're called great in the world. 26. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Let him be your servant, is what he's saying. Jesus says, I don't want my people to have the values of the world. Don't think like the world. I don't want my people to look at greatness and define it the way the world defines greatness. Greatness to God and greatness to the world are on polar opposites. Jesus is saying, in my church and in my kingdom, the great ones are the servants. Whoever serves the most wins. Whoever sacrifices and serves the most, who's, whoever is the most unselfish, wins. Whoever gives of themselves the most in an unselfish attempt to serve Jesus Christ and others wins the prize as the greatest. Totally opposite of the world. 
27. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. God's commandments, as I have said many times in the past, are a reflection of God's character. He is holy, and therefore so are his commandments. And Jesus tells us to serve others, which is a command. And it is also what Jesus himself did. He tells us to do good to those who are bad to us. And that is how he treats those who are bad to him. Jesus tells us to be generous to those who cannot repay our generosity. And that is how Jesus deals with us. Jesus is our God. Jesus is our creator. Jesus is our sustainer. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our judge. And Jesus is also our example. Verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus sacrificed his life to set people free from their sin, from the penalty of sin, which is hell, from the power of sin, which is sanctification, from the very presence of sin, which is going to be there when we are in our raised and glorified bodies. Jesus sacrificed himself, his life, to set people free from sin. And they are free, and they will be free, when they repent and receive him as Lord and Savior. Having our sins forgiven and having our sins is erased is the only way anyone can enter into the kingdom of heaven after they die. And Jesus accomplished that for us on the cross. Verse 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Jesus was very popular at this time. But it's not going to last. People are really fired up about Jesus right now. They think he's the greatest thing in the world, and he is. But they're not going to think that much longer. Once the crowd understands that his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, which requires people to repent of their sin. Once people realize that's what his kingdom is, instead of a material kingdom that destroys Rome and grants their every wish, once they realize that's what it is and that's what it isn't, their minds are going to change about Jesus in a hurry. They're not interested in repentance. They're not interested in being holy unto the Lord. They're not interested in sacrificing for Jesus. They're not interested in submitting to his lordship and trusting completely in his death on the cross. They're not interested in that. They're interested in having Jesus come into Rome and knock Caesar right off his throne and cause the Roman soldiers to all drop dead and to give all the Roman Empire to the nation Israel and then to give everybody free food and free wine, and free housing, and bumper crops. And a new donkey and a new horse, too, while you're at it. And a chariot, if you want it. Everything for everyone. That's what they think Jesus is going to bring. That's why they're fired up about him right now. Here's our Messiah, here's our King, and this is the list of things that we're going to receive from him. And they were wrong about every single one of them because their minds... We're in the flesh instead of in the spirit. They loved the world and the things of the world, and the love of the Father was not in them. So Jesus is not going to remain popular with them very much longer. Verse 30. And behold, look, it says, let's, let's read 29 too. It says, And as they departed from Jericho, 
Now they're getting close to Jerusalem. A great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men were sitting by the wayside when they heard that Jesus was passing by. And they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. So these two blind men knew what everybody else knew, that Jesus was the Messiah. It's just like, like I said, they had a warped view of what the Messiah was going to do as far as setting up his kingdom was concerned. But they knew he was the Messiah, and these two blind men knew about Jesus' ability to do miracles and that he was the Messiah. So that's why they call him the son of David, which was a title of the Messiah. They know Jesus is the only hope that they will ever have of seeing in this life again. So they cry out to him for mercy. Help us. Verse 31. And the multitude rebuked them that they should not, or that they should hold their peace. But they cried out the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. It was dangerous, in a way, to scream, Son of David, to Jesus in the midst of this huge crowd. I mean, I said before, and it's true, that he was very popular at this time. But this crowd, I'm talking about with the Jewish people, he was very popular right now with them. But this crowd also included Roman soldiers and Roman citizens and religious leaders who hated Jesus. And as I said, the son of David meant Messiah or the great king. So you got a ton of people cheering Jesus on as the son of David. You got these two blind men screaming, son of David, have mercy on us. And that's going to perk up the ears of the Roman soldiers and the Roman citizens who also know that that means great king. If Rome hears them referring to Jesus as the great king, they might think that the Jews led by Jesus a revolting against Caesar. And Caesar and the Roman soldiers will crush them in a heartbeat if that's what they think. So this was dangerous. But these blind men are way too desperate to care about things like that. They didn't care what anyone thought. They wanted the Lord's attention. But, you know, the people, the people say, hold it down a little bit here. We want to stir up the Romans against us. And they said, forget it. I'm not holding anything down. We, we're desperate. We need Jesus. We don't care. Verse 32, And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? Well, Jesus could see that they were blind, so he knew what they wanted, but he still wanted them to tell him. Just goes to show that God knows what we need, but he still wants us to pray. He still wants to ask. He says, you have not because you ask not. Our prayers do not enlighten God. They do not inform God. But our prayers provide grace, which draws us closer to God. And also, there are certain things that God simply won't do for us or through us unless we pray and ask. Say, so why did God set it up that way? I don't know. Ask him sometime. Verse 33. Then said, they, then said unto him, they said unto him, sorry, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. What a thrill to be in darkness for so long and then to see. Can you just imagine that? The last miracle recorded in this gospel was the one that made these two formerly blind men the happiest two men on earth. No wonder they follow Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can restore us physically as well as spiritually. Why would anyone want to follow anyone else? And he's going to restore us physically if we follow him and he allows us or we allow him to restore us spiritually right now. 
by repenting and receiving Christ as Lord and Savior, the physical restoration is coming when we are raised from the dead and given brand new glorified bodies that will never get sick, never get old, never die. You can study the Word of God right now, even though we're done here at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, listen, and follow along. Again, that's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if while you are there, the Word of God blesses you, please keep in mind that I depend on people like you, your prayers, and your financial support to keep this ministry going. This has been a faith ministry for 30 years which means I've always depended on you. You can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com as the Lord may lead. If you're fed and you're blessed, ask God if he would have you help this ministry. Click on the donate button and give as the Lord may lead in a secure method. Until next time, so long, everyone.